in internal medicine and then I specialized in sleep medicine. And sleep medicine is over there about six different subspecialties that uh, collaborate for sleep. And I'm just from medicine, but there are others from ENT, anesthesiology, psychiatry, family medicine, neuromedicine, uh, dental, dental sleep. All they have different boards. It's not only one sleep board, it's the one under sleep board that we have to pass. But every subspecialty comes with their own special areas of development and uh, professional questions and answers to pass that board or SAR. Today I'm going to talk about a little bit on sleep medicine and some treatment issues and I'll be happy to take any questions. It was very encouraging to see the development of DICE here. Seems like the whole morning was on DICE, um, drug-induced uh, sleep endoscopy, which is new in this field, but this is not the only thing. This may be a rise of a new development, but there is a background going on for a long period of time for sleep. So today I'm going to give a little presentation on the obstructive sleep apnea, how it presents, pathophysiology, complications, and uh, treatment options, uh, along with PAP therapy, positive airway pressure therapy, and hypoglossal nerve stimulation therapy. The prevalence of sleep apnea is really more than you think. It's about 9 to 38% globally. And in India, I only have Indian reference here, 2.6 to 4.96, so like 3 to 5%. In this room, I was counting maybe about 100 people in here today. And if you ask how many of them had a good night's sleep last night, I bet it will be 70, less than 70% of the people. 30% of people will raise their hands saying that they did not have a good sleep. Either because they shifted from one side or another, they snores, they stop breathing, wake up headache, wake up with choking, the spouse complains, doesn't stay in the same room because of the noise, so many things. So I don't want to go ahead and ask any questions, but this is taken in any amount of prevalence. This is pretty high and it is rising with the prevalence of obesity and other comorbidity. Nowadays in the institute I work in, I take a prevalence yearly and this year it was, last year was 24%, this year is 25%. Um, what is obstructive sleep apnea really? I know you all are very learned and knowledgeable people here, but I still want to give a little glimpse of what it is. So it's like a temporary cessation of breathing. We start sleep, we stop breathing. Now everybody stops breathing at sleep, could be, but is everybody a sleep apnea? Not really. This cessation has to be at least 10 seconds or more to call it an apnea. And this cessation of breathing or the amplitude has to come down more than 90% to call it an apnea. Apnea means not breathing. Hypopnea means small breathing. Like your amplitude of breathing is high and then it, all of a sudden you come to 30% of your breathing. That's your full breath. That's a small breath. So if it is less than 30% and with that you have a desat, desaturation of more than 3 to 4%, then you are going to count it as a hypopnea. With the amount of apnea and hypopnea overnight, if you sleep from 10 o'clock in the night, for example, to 6 o'clock in the morning, 8 hours of sleep, and somebody else is sitting there counting how many times you are stopping breathing or having the small breaths, hypopnea. So within these 8 hours, if you have those events more than 80, for example 80, and we want to know the AHI, you know from this morning everybody were talking about AHI, AHI, I know you all know, but I still just wanted to refresh our memory. So it's 80 divided by 8, which will be 10. That's how we count our apnea, hypopnea index. Any sleep study report, this is the major thing you want to look at. What is AHI? It's 10. 15, 20, or 100, and that defines your treatment plan. Okay. So uh, I'm going to skip this. This is the ENT conference. You all know what we are talking about: the um, narrowed airway, where the problem is, and patient is not getting the full breath. That's why it's obstructive sleep apnea, not a central sleep apnea. There are actually two kinds of sleep apnea. We are talking about the obstructive one here, which is, which is obstruction in the throat, where our 
ENT College scale picture. Uh, this is the uh, AHI definition. The patient is falling asleep. And if you see the inspiration and expiration completely stop for a while, and patient is still giving effort. That's why it's obstruction. There is obstruction in the throat, but still he's trying to take a breath in. And the other one is awake and asleep, and the amount of breath here, look at the amplitude, more than less than one part from previous amplitude. That's why it's hypopnea, and there's a desat after that, more than three to four percent. OSS severity, the AHI that I was talking about, five to fifteen is mild. 15 to 30 is moderate, more than 30 when you count it is severe sleep apnea. And the risk factors I'm not going to go over again, we all know male gender, obesity, increasing age, race, black race a bit more. If there is a craniofacial abnormality or familial or genetic abnormality, you can get it more. Symptoms, loud snoring, choking, gasping, observed apnea, someone is going to tell you I saw you stop breathing last night. Uh, you can have more, more headaches, morning headaches. I want to emphasize one thing here, sleep disruption is polyuria. Many patients may just come with one complaint and saying, I wake up too many times to go to the bathroom. They'll go to get a prostate uh, examined or get diabetes checked, but it's really not any of them. It's actually his sleep apnea. Waking him up, he's stopping breathing, and there is a hormone called ANP, atrial natriuretic peptide, that gets released from the heart, from sleep part because of sleep apnea. It squeezes the bladder, even though you don't have enough urine in here, you're still going to feel like I want to go to the bathroom. It's a defense mechanism for the body to keep you awake or keep you alive when you're going to die, basically. Um, this is the uh, oropharyngeal airway. We have seen a lot of picture today from the uvula with pitted with the uh, edema from overnight vibration. Uh, I'm not going to go over malampati score either. We know malampati three and four are high for getting high risk for obstructive sleep apnea. Now, who should get a sleep study? The patient who has any of those two above symptoms, snoring, observed apneas, or daytime sleepiness, which we measure with airport sleepiness score, if that's high, and if he has any of these comorbidities of hypertension, any new onset AFib, CBA, obesity, pulmonary hypertension, or uncontrolled CHF, congestive heart failure, can get uncontrolled when you are not treating your sleep apnea. So sleep is a cycle, about 90 to 120 minutes every night. We start with non-REM, go to the REM sleep. Initially, we start with non-REM 1 and non-REM 2 to non-REM 3, which is the delta sleep, which is the deepest sleep. And we go to our REM sleep, where we have the vivid um, eye movement or vivid dream. And most of the time, the more autonomic problem arises in the REM sleep, so you may see that REM AHI is always higher than the non-REM AHI, meaning that the breathing problem was much higher in the non-REM sleep than non-REM sleep. So there are types of sleep studies already um, this morning, uh, this will be redundant to talk about again, that type 1 is when you have the full sleep study with PSG, type 2 is non-monitored sleep study with the all EEG and other things. Type 3, when you have the, does not record any sleep stages, you have all those four uh, variables. Um, and the new one is the PAD, peripheral artery altometer, watch pads. This is our Bible there that we use for scoring, American Academy of Sleep Medicine scoring and associate uh, events, how to score, how to make sure we are counting it correctly and there is a standardized procedure for that. Um, this is a PSG from one of our patients. I was just trying to see. Sometimes, if you look at it, the EEG is showing the stage 2 non-REM sleep. This is the EMG and it's completely up. He is having a strong EMG. Uh, here, cardiac events, there is no cardiac events, EKG normal and the breathing is completely normal, but he's snoring. So if you continue this, at some point you're going to see some of these uh, events coming up where he's stopping breathing or 
continuing to have apnea or hypopnea. This is a REM event, and if you look at the rapid eye movement slaves here, um, the flattery waves here, and he, in the REM sleep, I was telling that this is the sleep time when we have most of our autonomic dysregulation, and he stopped breathing completely. There is a cessation, and this is a 30 second echo, 30 seconds. So it's at, at least it's more than more than 15 seconds. That's why it's an apnea. How does it affect other uh, systems? It causes hypoxia, reoxygenation, and hypercapnia. During the time of stopping breathing, you are going to drop the saturation anyway. It's going to cause sympathetic activation, metabolic dysregulation, and left atrial enlargement, causing the atrial fibrillation. Systemic and pulmonary hypertension, heart failure, and all kinds of arrhythmias will start to arise from untreated obstructive sleep apnea. Chronic kidney diseases, stroke and MI, and sudden death are pretty common. If you uh, recall the early morning de deaths, uh, number of deaths in the early morning is much higher than any time of the day when you, we have the REM sleep and we stop breathing. Um, I was going to talk a little bit about the dippers. Dippers are the who dips in their blood pressure. When we start to sleep, all our organs start to calm down and their blood pressure also drops about 10. Everybody is a deeper, except the one that don't deep, they become hypertensive and they have tendency of obstructive sleep apnea. Hypertension um, is very common from hypoxia, hypercapnia, and absence of lung inflation and microarousal at the end of the, um, each apnea. So if the patients come with resistant hypertension, and we do all kinds of investigation, but 60% of the cause relies in obstructive sleep apnea. If you treat the obstructive sleep apnea, the resistant hypertension would be better. Now I come to the treatment of sleep apnea. CPAP is the gold standard of treatment. Continuous positive airway pressure therapy or bi-level positive airway pressure therapy. This is the area we mostly work, and when CPAP fails, that's when we start to think about the other um, advancements. Oral appliance. Oral appliance is used only for mild obstructive sleep apnea. If you remember from the first part of the presentation, AHI from 5 to 15 is mild. So if your AHI is 5 or 10 or even 14, yes, you can try oral appliances. You don't want to try CPAP, that's okay. Oral appliance probably will work for you. And there was another presentation in front of me talking about excited USA. Yes, that also can work for um, mild obstructive sleep, sleep apnea. I have given about 30 excited USA so far. Um, and I would say 10 to 15 of them continued, the rest of them did not continue. It's not a great treatment, but it, it does help few people who doesn't want to use CPAP at all. Now, how does the CPAP work? We heard a lot today about how the airway opens up. So CPAP is a stent of the air that opening your airway up. But usually, if you look at this picture here, all of them are opening the air up transversely not anteroposteriorly. At 5 cm, this was the diameter, transverse diameter. 10 cm opened up more transversely, 15 more transversely. But none of them really opened up anteroposterior diameter. That's where ENT comes to work for the uh, hypoglossal nerve stimulation, where the tongue movement becomes an issue, and CPAP really cannot offer that. This one, I was trying to say how the CPAP is helping in this study. For mean arterial pressure drop to minus 10, systolic to minus 8, and diastolic about minus 11 to 12, compared to untreated sleep apnea from, with CPAP. CPAP improves hypertension control. This was 118 patients with severe OSA. When you treat optimally with CPAP, their blood pressure dropped by 10 centimeters or more. When they were treated with suboptimal CPAP, like if the CPAP requirement is 40, you are giving the patient up 10. That's really not going to open up our airway as much so that he can get the full breaths. Those of the patients are not going to benefit from having uh, the treatment. Uh, even though you are giving treatment, it's like giving the blood pressure medication 
if the dose is 10, you are giving 5 mg and his blood pressure is not being controlled. So you have to give optimal treatment to get the optimal result. How does it work? Uh, it keeps uh, the airway open, it keeps us uh, from non-desaturation, improves hypertension, 50% reduction in AHI is needed for optimal control of blood pressure. So in CPAP therapy, we don't look at 50% 50 50 reduction of AHI. We look at full recovery of AHI. We want the AHI to be less than 5. If it's not less than 5, then it's not treated. And we work harder or give alternate therapies or, or other therapies to get it down. In case of the patients who are non-compliant, we'll talk about a little bit more on them. So this was a patient who uh, started initial part of the study. If you look at his EKG rhythm, you can see that he's uh, getting a SVT, supraventricular tachycardia. The first, night of, first part of the study here. He's in stage three sleep, he's still breathing, he's tachypnic. Then we put him on the CPAP here. Uh, and later part of the night, with the CPAP, his SVT completely came down to normal sinus without any medications. So his heart was getting like stressed out and he was putting more beats in. If you record the PSGs, I mean the polysomnographies, most of them you see there is some atrial fibrillation or something going on. So 35% of the patients are non-compliant with CPAP. That's a worldwide problem. And I'm sure it's more of a problem in Bangladesh than anywhere because we don't have a good system of follow-up on these patients. You just give a CPAP to the patient and say, go use it. I don't think they're going to use it as such and you're going to get any benefit until you really follow them, tweak them, change the pressure, put the mask on and let them breathe through it and see how the improvement is happening. So this is another therapy, hypoglossal nerve stimulation therapy and one of our uh, big brothers here from Ireland already spoke about it today. Um, so this is uh, something that we do in our institute. We have done about 150 so far hypoglossal nerve stimulation um, implant. Our ENT surgeon, he does put the implant in, then we do the activation. From getting the implant in is where their job is done and ours starts where to put the activation in, which bolt you are going to put it in, how the tongue is going to move and then process from there if it's polysomnography is showing any improvement in the sleep apnea at all or not. So there are so many um, dynamics in there um, that you will find once you do the procedure and follow these patients. Um, I just brought one of these remotes to show how it works. It's pretty simple that the patient will put this, uh, their hands on this green button here and when the implant is done, they're going to press it and put it on there, it's going to activate the genioglossus muscle and the tongue is going to move out. It's very funny to look at those patients. I'm, I'm, as a doctor, I don't mean funny, funny, but it just looks like a frog. Their tongue is going to come out and this area is going to swell up in front of it. And patient, some patients do well on sleep, like they will not, we do overnight titrations on them with the inspired place and then starting it with the device and see how they are doing or sleeping. Most important thing is if the patient is able to sleep on that or not. Um, how much bolt you are going to give, what direction you are going to give, how is his tolerance. The purpose of this is not to keep you awake and to let the move the tongue. That's not the point. The point is you want to have him in good sleep at the same time you want the tongue to come forward in every inspiration. Um, it's a pulse therapy, and this is not a preventive therapy. It's a continuous therapy. So with the sensor, if you look at the sensor out there, it's going to sense your inspiration every time. Once you're inspiring, where is it going to give you the stimulus or activate you? How long is it going to, how many microseconds, milliseconds, is going to give you the activation for? and then when it's going to subside. These are the things that we do as a physician, not as a, I'm not, I'm surgeons can do it too. But I'm just saying my part here. And then uh, we're going to bring this patient back every two weeks, every four weeks, every six weeks. And you can also check them with the cloud. Uh, I was showing you where the calf is in the genioglossus muscle, how uh, that is 
uh, that is uh, being implanted. And uh, also, who is the candidate for it? So this is a new FDA regulation that came out after 15 to 60, now it's 15 to 100 actually, uh, for AHI. So persons has to be 18 years or older, they have to have a moderate to severe degree of obstructive sleep apnea. And the AHI used to be 15 to 60 in the past, so we had trouble to figure, figure out who is going to get the uh, AGI. If the patient is 65 AHI, they will be rejected. Now they have seen that even the AHI is 80 or 90, they are still benefiting from it. So now the, uh, they have expanded the range to 15 to 100 about a few months ago that uh, FDA approved it. And they have to fail CPAP. It's not like anybody can come to the office and say, hey doc, I don't want any CPAP, I don't want anything on my face. I just want to go for a surgery with a remote control. It's not that easy. At, 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 at it seems to you. Like you implant the therapy, you have to heal it good, and not only the surgery itself, it's how the outcome is. We are treating sleep here, not treating the incisions. So if the patient is not able to tolerate the tongue movement, it's going to be a failure. So that's why we have to carve out actually who is going to benefit from it and how we are going to change out if in case there is failures, we had about, uh, I would say, 15 patients that failed the therapy out of 150. And these 15 patients failed because of different reasons, different comorbidities, intolerance, and sometimes their tongue muscles did not move or move too hard than what we thought it would be. Um, I just had a patient maybe a week ago who was on a level of, I'm sorry, if I'm taking too much time, I'll just take one more minute at the now. So he was on a level of 1 to 10, that's where we give the therapy at. I'm going to skip this because this has been spoken already. Uh, we know that uh, it has to have a lateral, if there is a more than 75% lateral collapse, we cannot do the uh, impact. It has to be anterior posterior collapse. If you see, it's a more of a lateral collapse, uh, more than 75% of the lateral collapse, and if the central uh, apnea is more than 25%, then he is not a candidate for HGM. So approximately 80% of the patients are good candidates. So they have to have a stable lateral wall and less than 75% of the lateral wall collapse in dyes to determine if they are going to benefit from it. Um, they are not a good candidate with lateral collapse again. So once the Inspire is implanted, like with the generator and the sensing lead and the stimulation lead, these are three areas like Dr. Mateen, Mateen has uh, said in the, in the morning. So the sensing lead is going to sense when the patient is inspiring and that's when it's going to determine at which area it's going to give the pulse. And once the patient comes back after the surgery, sometimes you can get some uh, neuro, neuro pressure, pressure of the uh, tongue, like they're somewhere they're sensing more or their tongue moving to the one side or more on the other side. But that usually passes after five to six weeks that that's, that gets better. Um, some of them will have feel like I have a knot in my tongue, or I feel like something I, when I swallow, I feel something in there. Those are going to pass too. It resolves within a few weeks. So then the activation system, this is the connector that you're going to put on and the programmer. The programmer is where we are going to try to program it for the patient. And this is the cloud-based data that you can see how the patient is using uh, the Inspire. So if you look at here, you can see that he is using it how many hours and what volt. The volt that we placed here, it was 1.6. There is a range that you are going to put the volt in and it will be 10. If you start it at like 1, then you're going to give the highest range to two. And every 
week, he's going to try to step up one step at a time. So if he does one, then 1.1, next day 1.2, and 1.3, every week he's going to try to go up. It's like, a, like going to the gymnasium, you're going to make your muscles stronger. You're going to give the full thirst on the first day he's going to fail. So gradually you have to create your hypoglossal nerve strong enough, especially your muscles strong enough, that you can still thirst it and you also can sleep with it. So it's a gradual process which happens over um, about 10 weeks time, then you bring the patient back, do the overnight titration on that Inspire, and then see how he's sleeping. We want to see a good REM sleep, we want to see no AHI, if possible, low AHI, then we're going to follow this patient up. Thank you so much for giving me this time.